Happy early St. Paddy's Day, whiskey noobs. I know what you're probably thinking. It's a little bit early for St. Paddy's Day. But we have a very special guest for St. Paddy's Day next week, and so I wanted to make sure we still got in a review of an Irish whiskey prior to St. Paddy's Day in case you guys want to go out and buy it for St. Paddy's Day. But before we get to that, my name is Chris, and I am the host of the show. And for those of you who are new here, you are listening to the Whiskey Noobs Podcast. As I mentioned, today's episode is is going to be a review of an Irish whiskey, specifically Powers John's Lane Irish whiskey. And I'm also going to be sort of walking through step by step a tasting uh, once again, just because I feel like it is very important to do that every once in a while, even if you're experienced, flex those muscles of really digging into a tasting and really making sure you're nosing it and paying attention to it and it just brings you back to being present you know if you're really if you're not doing those things if you're not um, really paying attention to how you're nosing it really paying attention to how you're tasting it then you're not really being present which is fine if that's not what you want but for me that's one of my favorite parts of doing a tasting so every once in a while I like to really remind myself in a step-by-step manner how to go through a tasting and I think it's important for me to do that for you guys as well that way especially if you're on the email list and you bought this already then you are able to do it right along with me or if you're drinking whatever it is that you're drinking at home you can still walk through your tasting right along with me Before we get any farther, I do want to take a second to ask you to take just a minute of your time and rate and review, if possible, the show. Depending on your app, you may or may not be able to actually leave a typed out review. If you could do that, it makes a huge difference, helps boost our numbers, and really helps uh, get the show out to new people, which in turn helps keep the show going. So if you have a second to do that, that would be very much appreciated. But let's get to Powers John's Lane Whiskey. Now, as I mentioned, I'm going to do a nice in-depth review of this because sometimes even I forget what I'm doing with these reviews. But before we get into the actual review portion, I want to talk about the whiskey and what exactly we're tasting here. So Powers is an Irish whiskey brand. So this is an Irish whiskey, which is kind of the point since St. Paddy's Day is coming up. And the thing that I will say about the website is I was not a super huge fan of the amount of information that they give on this. So unless I'm on the wrong page, they pretty much just give you the tasting notes. And aside from that, they don't give you any info that's like even written on the bottle. So like you have to go to the bottle to get more of the information. Not a super big fan of that, but I do have information from the bottle. So we are going to talk about that a little bit and then we can dig into our tasting. So, while I can't tell you much from the website, I can tell you what I get from the bottle, and then also just a bit about powers in general. Um, When I say I can't find a lot of information, I can't find a lot of information on this bottle, John's Lane, specifically. Uh, Like, you know, uh, specific information on the mash bill. They don't even put, like, the ABV and stuff on the website, unless I'm on the wrong page. Uh, But powers in general is a very well-known Irish whiskey brand, and they are... A part, or they helped to establish a conglomerate of Irish whiskey distillers that kind of came together to form Irish Distillers, which is the name. It's just called Irish Distillers. Um, and we're actually going to learn more about that next week on our St. Paddy's Day special with our special guest. So no need to worry if that's a little bit confusing. We're going to actually dive a lot deeper into that next week. But what's important is that uh, Powers is a pretty well-known Irish whiskey brand, and John's Lane specifically is their 12-year-old um, single pot still selection or expression, if you will, of their Irish whiskey. For those of you who are a little bit newer to the terminology, single pot still, it, you can learn more about it in episode 11 about Irish whiskey, but single pot still is at least 30% malted barley and 30% unmalted barley in the mash bill, and it also can have up to 5% of other cereals. So while it's a minimum of 30% malted barley, 30% unmalted barley, the combination of those two has to add up to 95%. So you typically have a lot more than 30% of at least one of them. So you've got that and then 5% of other cereals, up to 5% of other cereals. It has to be produced in a pot still, which is a type of still, and it has to be produced at a single distillery, thus the single name. Otherwise, you could just call it a pot still if it met all that criteria but was not just a single distillery. 
So if it meets all of that criteria, then it's a single pot still. Uh, and once again, you can hear more about that and about Irish whiskey in general if you go back to episode 11 about Irish whiskey. And then one last note on this is that it is 43% alcohol by, or sorry, 46% alcohol by volume or 92 proof. And that's most of the information that I can actually get from at least the bottle and the website. Once again, unless I'm looking in the wrong spot, I'm not seeing a terrible amount of information. They do have this one little blurb on it that I'll read. So it says, the John's Lane release is a celebration of the original style of Powers Whiskey in the quintessential Irish single pot still distillate. Matured for 12 years, the result is an astounding, lingering, robust taste that provides a perfect tribute to the spiritual home of one of Ireland's most loved whiskeys. So why do they say the spiritual home of the whiskey? The reason they're saying that is because Powers moved from John's Lane Distillery in Dublin. It moved to Middleton, but John's Lane Distillery itself still stands in Dublin. So so while the Powers Distillery moved, uh, that's why they're saying the spiritual home of Powers was originally in Dublin. And so that's what they're kind of celebrating here. Now, I'm going to pour myself a glass, and then we will walk through a tasting a little bit more in depth. I want to start doing episodes episodes like this more often not super often but just as little checkpoints to remind myself and you guys the you know the proper i don't want to say proper the most effective way to walk through a tasting in my personal opinion so this is just how i do it i'm giving you my favorite way of doing it my tips that i think have had the most success over the years over my time in tasting whiskey and do with that what you will what you will put your own flair on it don't be afraid to try different things but let's walk through it the way that I typically would I want to do something that I don't normally do and that's actually explain to you guys what's going through my head as it's going through my head rather than just giving you the notes that I'm getting from it so step number one with any tasting is nosing the whiskey When you're doing this, you want to get your nose as close to it as you can without it burning. Typically, what I will do for this is I will slowly get my nose closer and closer to the glass, breathing in through my nose until it burns. And then I'll just back up a little bit away from it. And that is the the best spot to really get the most flavor. The newer you are, the farther away that's going to be from the whiskey. As you get more experienced and you get more used to it, that's going to get closer and closer to the whiskey. So that's going to be my first step is to find that spot and get a quick nose of it. You can do this with your mouth closed, with your mouth open. It's always recommended to use an open mouth when you do this. But something that I think people miss sometimes is also having a closed mouth while you do it. I like to personally do both and just kind of get an idea for the character of the whiskey. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to get as close as I can without it burning. And the first nose is going to be very general. I'm just trying to get an idea of what characteristics the whiskey has. And we can do that using the Whiskey Noobs notes list. If you don't already have it, you can email whiskeynoobspodcast at gmail.com and I will send it over to you. Just let me know you want the flavor list. And I'm going to get some general notes from it. I'm going to use the subtitles on the flavor list rather than the specific notes. So let's do that. Let's find the optimal spot away from the whiskey where my nose isn't burning and just get a gut feeling for what this is going to smell like. Okay. On the nose, I have a couple of gut feelings. The first and probably the most prevalent for me right now is fruity. I got I got fruits. I'm not going to get specific because that's just my first nose, just my first idea of what it tastes like or what it smells like. And I also got some bakery sweetness. I got a little bit of something that is sweetening it outside of the fruit. It's not quite the fruit, but it's a sweetness that's there as well. That's just a very general what kind of a thing I am smelling. And once again, I'm, t- I'm pulling these notes from my notes list. You can also look up flavor wheels online, whatever you want in order to just have a list of notes in front of you that can be helpful. Uh, you don't always have to do that, and I certainly do not always do that, but it is helpful every once in a while. Especially using a notes list, sometimes you might um, see notes that you kind of forgot about. Like I know sometimes I'll go a while without saying maple, and I won't think about it, and then I'll hear maple, and I'll think, oh, that's a really good one. So uh, notes lists can be helpful no matter how experienced you are. It can be super helpful. Now that first nose, we got that general gut feel. I'm saying fruity, and I'm saying bakery sweet, some sweetness other than fruity. Um, Hopefully you have yours kind of locked in, what sort of categories you're looking at. 
And the second nose is where I try to get a little bit more specific. And I also play with my nose's proximity to the whiskey. I might move it back and forth a little bit, get a little bit farther away, see if anything more subtle pops up, get a little bit closer in, see if there's any complexities in there that I missed the first time around. And don't be afraid to start narrowing down those notes instead of saying fruity, say what type of fruit, those sorts of things, if you are able to. So I'm going to go ahead and do that once again closed mouth sometimes, open mouth sometimes. If you're wondering what that open mouth does, it just allows air to flow through your nasal cavity a little bit better. So it does help to especially pull out some of the nuance. But the benefit of the closed mouth would be basically the opposite. You can kind of see what's really sticking its head out. What is the real obvious flavors in it, which is why I like to do both. So alternating open mouth, closed mouth, alternating proximity to the whiskey, and then starting to narrow in what types of flavors I am getting. So I'm going to go ahead with that second nose. One thing I'll mention as we are going through this second nose is don't be afraid to agitate a little bit, especially if you're having trouble smelling it. Uh, Glen Cairns or tulip-shaped glasses can really help with this. Uh, if you can swirl the whiskey a little bit, get it agitated just a bit, that will um, kind of get some of those fumes to push towards your nose a little bit. So don't be afraid to do that, and it should help you narrow in on what notes you're smelling. All right, so this time around, I'm going to narrow it down a little bit in terms of the fruitiness. So for sure there's fruitiness. Originally, I would have said apricot right off the bat probably, or some kind of a stone fruit. Stone fruits being those ones that have pits in them. Think apricots, peaches, plums, those sorts of things. But this is a brighter one, so I would I would say apricot. Um, that was the, my first nose. In my second nose, or my first smell of this most recent nosing, let's say, the second time around, I got a little bit closer in, and I almost thought maybe it was more like green apples. It had this slightly pale, almost sour scent to it. Um, so I'm going to kind of go with both. It's kind of a weird combination of the two. And then there's, it's definitely accompanied by bakery sweetness, a really nice kind of sweetness. I would call it vanilla and honey combined. Maybe just like a touch, maybe just leaning towards the caramel, but it's more, more less than caramel. It's more like a rich honey to me, and it's backed up by some vanilla that also adds just a little bit of character to it. The last one that I will use to describe the nose in this phase would be almost creamy. Uh, and this is where having a notes list in front of you really helps. Because I wouldn't have thought to say cream except if I wasn't already looking under the bakery sweet section here. I could see what you might call like a creaminess to it. It almost is more of like a texture of the flavors, if that makes sense. They all come together in this smooth, somewhat like creamy fashion that reminds you of, for example, rather than a honey-flavored barbecue sauce, it's more like a honey-flavored cream or milk or ice cream, something like that. Um, it comes across more in that regard. And then while I'm going through the nose here, I'm going to do a third nosing, which you can do as many as you want. I typically like to do at least three before I get into the palate. That's just me personally. The palate is really probably going to affect your thoughts on the nose. So we're going to come back after we do the palate. But I like to do about three noses to really get an idea of what I'm thinking prior to actually tasting it on my palate. And on the third time around, I'm going to not just look at those categories, Hopefully you weren't already just looking at the categories you narrowed it down to, but this time around I'm really going to walk through the categories I hadn't mentioned, like nuttiness, woodiness, other stuff like tobacco and leather, spices, citrus, really look through those categories and see if I'm getting anything specific from them, and then we're going to move on to the palette. Once again, keeping my nose safely far enough away that it's not burning too much, Kind of moving a little closer, kind of moving a little farther away, opening the mouth, closing the mouth. All of these things are going to reveal different nuances to you, so I'm going to do all of them. And you'll probably develop your favorite way kind of as you go. This, and maybe I'm a little bit biased because I have tasted this before. I know that on the palate I get this. This on the nose, though, I do think I'm getting a little bit of a general spiciness. I don't know if it's strong enough to even really pick out a specific spice, and sometimes that's kind of the case, 
And this is where the palate can really come in and help us out and say, oh, now I, now I know what that was. But um, on the nose, I think I'm getting a general spiciness of like baking spices, not like your herbs or anything like that, but like baking spices. Um, so I'm getting something generally in that area. And I think that's about as good as I can do for the nose right now. As I mentioned, we will come back to We are going to put this all together. We're doing A, then B, then C. And then you put it all together and you can really see how they interact. And that really makes it more fun towards the end here. So let's move on to the palate. This is the big show. This is what everybody really cares about, right? That's why I like to take my time with the nose. Get three noses in. Really understand the whiskey as much as I can. Start to put together in my head what I'm expecting on the palate, which can really be fun because if it's something that's not what you were expecting, then it's really a surprise. It's really enjoyable. So I I put it together really well in the nose with those three noses, and then I'm ready to jump into the palate, which everybody wants to just jump right into. On the palate, before we even take a sip, you have to typically do a sacrificial sip. I shouldn't say you have to. I should say you do, no matter what, whether you want it to be a sacrificial sip or not. You might pull some very major notes from it during that sacrificial sip, but most of the time your palate's going to be pretty shocked if you haven't drank whiskey lately. So you're going to do a sip, and I call it sacrificial because you're not going to get a whole lot of flavor from it. You're, it's going to burn a little bit. But when you're doing that, make the most use of it. Coat your tongue. Do the Kentucky chew a little bit. If you haven't heard of that, it's when you basically chew the whiskey. You can do my version of it that I like to do where I basically touch my tongue to the roof of my mouth and it basically swishes it back and forth up and under my tongue and then over top of my tongue. You can do that. Really coat your palate. Make the most use out of that sacrificial sip so that when you go for your second sip, your whole palate is primed. If you just get it on a little bit of your tongue and it burns and then you come back for your second sip, that rest of your tongue is going to get hit by it and then it's still going to sacrifice another sip. So you don't want that. So make use of it. Coat your tongue. See if you do pull some very major notes from it and then come back with a second sip. So I'm going to go forward with that sacrificial sip and just give you an idea of what I'm getting from it. Okay, sacrificial sip is over. What did I learn from it? Well, one thing you can really start to get an idea for, especially if you've had a lot of whiskeys, is how harsh or easy to drink the whiskey is going to be from the sacrificial sip. Usually your first sip is always going to be some amount of harsh, but you can get an idea of how harsh compared to other first sips that you've had, essentially. For me specifically, I would say with this Powers, I'm going to anticipate it's going to be pretty oily, pretty easy to drink, not overly harsh, but still have some spice to it because I've had some that really on the first sip, it's almost like you're not even sacrificing it. And then I've had others that, of course, really shock your palate. This is leaning towards the not too harsh of a sacrificial sip. I also got a little bit of flavor from it, brought in some graininess that I didn't get quite as much on the nose, a little bit of maltiness. But we'll break that down here with the actual palate of our second sip here. And um, I just I didn't get overall too much burn, not too much drying out of the tongue. Uh, you'll notice sometimes your tongue feels like it's got cotton balls on it. That's because you are it's a little bit too harsh and it's really got a dry finish to it. That's what people call dry finish. Um, so that's kind of the, the idea of what you can get from that first sip. But let's go in with a second sip. And now we're going to look back at that notes list or at that flavor wheel you're looking at. And we're going to look for categories. Also in the back of your mind, maybe have those notes you pulled out on the nose, kind of just kind of thinking about them, seeing if that's what you're getting. But I don't want to influence what I'm getting from the palate based on what I got from the nose. Like I said, we'll put all that together. But first, I really want to analyze them separately because that can really, if you try to be not biased, I know it's difficult. If you try not to think about that nose except keeping it in the back of your mind, then you can pull out some stuff that's not in the nose and that really points out a complexity in the whiskey. So I'm going to go ahead and do that with my second sip here, really thinking about the main categories that I'm getting, the types of uh, things that I, I'm tasting and how it's feeling in my mouth. Just get a gut feel for the whiskey. On the palate, I'm right away getting more of that fruit. I think the fruit's a little bit more sour on the palate. It's On the nose, I got a little bit of sourness, but it's a little bit more sour on the palate. The bakery sweet, to me, is really taking a back seat 
in the beginning of the palette, and then later on it's coming in a little bit stronger, along with what I might call new wood and or maltiness or graininess. Malt, maltiness is kind of just the, the flavor that malted barley brings you, so it's something that you kind of get the hang of as you drink more, more malted barley-based uh, whiskeys. And it's got this kind of specific, kind of like if you've ever smelled grain in like a grain bin from like a farmer, like that's been harvested, it's got kind of that taste to it, if that makes any amount of sense to me. That, that's what I'm calling maltiness, graininess, etc. Or I guess a more rela- relatable example for some folks might be like a really multi-grain bread, like something with a lot of grain on it. It kind of, you'll, you'll start to taste similar to what that bread tastes like. So in general, that's kind of the idea of what I'm getting. Now, this third time through, that's where I'm really going to compare to the nose. I'm really going to focus on specific notes, and I'm really going to pay attention to the transition of it a little bit. Is it moving or changing? And you can do this in multiple sips if you want. I like to do it at this point. I think I can do it all in one sip. But if you want to break it up a little bit, first go for some notes. Take as many sips as you need. Uh, and then start to look for transitions in the palate as well. Is it always fruity? Is it always sweet? Does some Do some notes come in from the front in the beginning and some move to the front in the end? What's happening there? So I'm going to go ahead and do that, try to break it down a little bit more, and then we'll really talk about the overall palate. Okay, so to elaborate a little bit more, the fruitiness has definitely got some sourness to it. I keep bopping back and forth between green apples and apricot, which I know are super different. But I think it's almost the flavor of apricot, but the sourness of green apples is kind of what I'm getting. That punches me. As soon as I take the sip, that's what I'm getting. Then, almost immediately, very quickly, I get this sweetness. It's it's still like a really rich honey to me. It's kind of maybe deeper Um, maybe leaning more towards like a brown sugar, almost a little bit of breadiness. But I would say the breadiness comes at the very end. You've got multi graininess along with honey, almost weirdly like Honey Nut Cheerios, like that sort of a thing right at the end. Um, So in the beginning, sourness, a little bit of fruitiness, um, and then it pretty quickly, pretty dramatically to me, transitions into that deep sweetness, graininess, Uh, maybe a little bit of breadiness and all throughout you've got a little bit of spiciness that I would say is maybe nutmeg but in general definitely a little bit of spiciness all throughout like I said in the nose it might just be that it's not strong enough to really pick out which type of spice it is definitely a type of baking spice not like an herb but which specific baking spice a little bit hard to say I'd say that's kind of strong all the way throughout it though I'd even throw in a little bit of like a new wood. So you've kind of got like new wood, like you can imagine sawdust cutting two by fours, walking through the wood department at like a um, hardware store or something like that. And you've also got like old wood, like a tree that's been down in the woods for a couple years and you walk up on it. It's got that kind of old, not like rotten in a bad way, but like decaying. That still sounds really bad. That old, slightly funkier wood taste. And you'll get that a lot on things that are very old and in very charred barrels. But I'm not getting a lot of that from this. I'm getting more of what I would call a new wood. Not a lot of char, not a lot of burn. Um, Burn like in terms of the wood, like not smoky, not charred. Little bit of woodiness. And that's also kind of throughout, I would say, stronger towards the end of the palate. Now, at this point in the palette, we can move on to the finish, but you can also do some tricks, Uh, one of which I really enjoy is taking a sip of water, drinking most of it, leaving a little bit of that water in your mouth, and then taking a sip of the whiskey to dilute that. I'm going to go ahead and do that real quick, and sometimes just try to pay attention for anything you didn't notice before. Sometimes things might be a little bit hidden by that burn, they might be a little bit hidden by other notes, and when you dilute it, it almost spreads out all the notes, if that makes sense. This is how I picture it in my head. It's spreading all the notes out across your tongue and allowing you to pick out those those little notes that weren't really there. So sometimes it works, sometimes it's a huge difference, sometimes it's not very much of a difference. So I'm going to go ahead and do that, and then we're going to move on to the finish. See, that time I got a much darker image. It it almost eliminated some of that sourness. I got a much deeper fruitiness, maybe even some red fruit when when trying it with that water. Almost a little bit plummy or a little bit like cherry. Some some dark fruit. 
in almost darker sweetness, closer to like a maple mixed with a grain, that sort of a thing. Um, so that's a really, this one definitely has a, a good bit of change to it uh, when trying it with a little bit of water. So that that's one of those things, sometimes it makes a big difference, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, I would even almost, now that I'm thinking about it, and especially since I have this notes list in front of me, once again, can't say enough good things about notes lists, flavor wheels, etc., Maybe like a nuttiness in there that I wouldn't have caught on to. Um, almost like a peanut, which I don't say often, but uh, definitely deepens out and makes those flavors a little bit darker when you try it with that little bit of water. Uh, once again, helps reveal some of that nuance. That sourness that was up front, it was kind of clouding what I was tasting, and so that water really helps get rid of that a little bit and focus me in on the things that I was missing. But let's move on to the finish where we are going to pay a lot of attention to what's happening in our mouth right as we swallow and after we swallow. And I can already say from all the palate tasting that I've been doing, I have some pretty specific thoughts on the finish for this one. But try to pay attention. This can really, the end of the palate and the finish are this kind of gray area where you're getting... The palate is changing, and then when you really, when you swallow it, when it's gone and the fumes are left in your mouth and the coating is left in your mouth, then what comes to the forefront? That's what we're looking for in the finish. We're also paying a lot of attention to how it's making our mouth feel. Is it making your mouth feel dried out? Is it making your mouth feel oily? Those are typically the two ends of the spectrum. Get an idea for that. Most people, myself included, prefer, at least from my experience, I shouldn't, I haven't taken a survey, but I think most people prefer the oily feel to the dry feel. So try to focus on that. Focus on how the flavor is changing on the finish. You don't have to do this too many times because usually it becomes pretty obvious. But the big thing is after you take that gulp, after you you swallow it, pay attention to how long the finish lasts. This can be a, a pretty big price point mover for some people. Some people really want that finish to last a long time. So pay attention to how long you're tasting strong flavor and at what point you're really having to say, okay, I'm really trying to taste it now. Um, but it's not as prevalent on my palate anymore. So that's what I'm going to do. Don't worry about the nose. Don't worry about the palate. I mean, you can you can enjoy the palate for sure, but focus in on that finish as you're swallowing the whiskey. So as I mentioned, I, I already have an opinion formed on this finish. I think right as soon as you swallow, it pretty dramatically, any sour fruit that was left behind, any of that, that fruity, flavorful type flavors that you're getting on the palate, <laughs> any of that that's still left behind, when you swallow, it goes away from me and I get super strong graininess, super strong honey nut Cheerios, multi-grain bread with butter and honey on it, that type, maybe granola, granola would be a really good descriptor for this, super strong, grainy granola and sweet finish on this for me a little bit of that bitter note that I usually say reminds me of licking an envelope licking the glue on an envelope um, a little bit of that but very forward with those sweet notes and it's not without a little bit of cost I do also tend to get a little bit of burn with this just a, a bit a little bit of dryness it's not overly oily it's definitely not overly dry it leans towards the oily in my opinion but it still dries my tongue out just a touch and and maybe that's accompanied by a little bit of black pepper that helps hide it a little bit but you can almost say that anytime there's a little bit of burn but it rounds it out with a nice complexity and the next step, I'm going to kind of spoiler a little bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a little bit of a spoiler here. The next step is to put all of them together. And what I really like about this one from the first time I tried it and this time right now, and I want you to look for is how much it transitions. We're going to smell it. We're going to do a, a nice nose of it, get an idea for what we're smelling, then take a sip, get an idea for how it's different, then as you swallow it, get an idea for how it changes. And you're going to see a pretty good example of a change between nose, palate, and finish. And just by chance, I picked this one for this episode. But what I really like about it is the palate doesn't have so much transition that it's kind of hard to follow or too complex. It's almost pretty distinctly nose, then palate, then finish. So try to pay attention to that. 
I'm going to come back with my thoughts on what exactly I'm getting, and then we will round this this review out with what they say you should get, what the Powers Distillery says you should get. So piecing it together here, this is the first time we're really looking at the full puzzle and not any pieces of it. After I've tasted it, now when I go back and nose it, the nose has way more vanilla, way more of al- almost marshmallowy level of vanilla to it. That's on the nose, but I'm still getting that that fruitiness, that graininess, but now that I'm comparing it to the palate and to the finish, I'm seeing way more of the vanilla. Then on the palate, I'm seeing that sour fruit. That sour fruit is there on the nose and on the palate for me. I'm seeing both of those. But then it's going to transition, as I mentioned, into kind of that grainy honey. I'm getting a lot of honey on the palate. A little bit of spice backing it up a little bit, which brings a little bit of complexity. And then on the finish, that's when that honey is backing up a little bit and that grain is coming forward. And it's, the honey is deepening maybe a little bit, maybe more of a darker honey with a little bit more of that grain. And the grain really is forward on the finish to me. Once again, drying out my tongue just a touch, not overly oily, but definitely not overly dry. So those are the types of things that I'm getting from it. If you've been drinking alongside me, hopefully you have your notes in your head, have an idea for what you think you get from it. If you want, pause this, go back and do it again. Do the nose palate finish real quick, get an idea, or don't be real quick, take your time with it. Being present, that's what this is all about for me. This, you know, whiskey should not be about getting drunk 99% of the time, if not 100% of the time. For me, I'd say 100% of the time. So focus on being present. Focus on enjoying this masterpiece that we're drinking. This isn't a cheap whiskey, and it really, to me, is showing in the palate. Unpause if that's, you know, (laughs) if you paused it. And let's move into the tasting notes that they say you should get. Now, you've been drinking right along with me. You've heard all of the things that I said, and now we're going to see what they say you should get. Bear in mind, anytime you look at a distiller's notes, a lot of times they will dress them up to be a little bit more complex and a little bit more in-depth than they typically should be uh, or than your average person would say they are. But what I do like to do is get an idea of where those came from, and that can really help you to establish your notes a little bit better. If you say vanilla and they say caramel try to taste it again and see why it is that they said caramel that sort of a thing so let's go through the tasting notes that they say we should get right off the bat the nose is very different from what i think i get they say an abundance of earthy aromas leather tobacco with layers of charred wood dark chocolate and treacle toffee treacle toffee i'll be full disclosure here i'll be fully transparent I have no idea what that type of toffee means, but I know what toffee tastes like. So they're saying much darker, earthier, more bitter notes than what I was saying. Personally, on my gut reaction, I did not see that. I'm going to go through now. I'm going to give them a fair shake and see which of these notes I can pull, if any. Now, I get asked all the time, what's your opinion on Pappy Van Winkle? Why don't you do more reviews on more expensive and rare bottles? I love Budget Bourbon March Madness. Why don't you do that with top shelf whiskeys? The simple answer that I think we all know is whiskey costs money. So if you want to help fund some of those reviews, fund the show, fund the microphones, the cameras, the lights, all of it, then you have got to go check out the Whiskey Noobs Patreon page. You're going to get behind the scenes, exclusive content, and I might even post some of those expensive reviews to Patreon first, since my patrons are the ones buying the bottles. If you recognize that whiskey isn't free and you want to help support the show, go check that out right now at patreon.com slash whiskey noobs, or click the link in the show notes or in my bio on either of my social medias. Thank you so much to everybody who does support the Patreon. I could not do this without you guys. I am forever grateful to you. God bless you. This, to me, the nose that they list comes across way darker than what I'm getting right now. What I'm getting right now and what I was getting previously when I tried this, I don't see it. I do see a couple of them, so I will mention those. I see the dark chocolate, maybe not so dark, definitely not an overly dark chocolate, but I see a little bit of a chocolatiness and a little bit of a toffee mixed in with those bakery spices, kind of how I mentioned a very rich honey. I can see those as being part of that bakery sweetness i kind of and maybe it's because i drink so much bourbon i i stand by not seeing charred wood i would argue new wood is not too bad 
uh, probably not charred wood, at the very most like a toasted wood. And then leather and tobacco, to me, seem pretty far off. This is personal opinion here, personal bias. I'm not seeing the leather and the tobacco, it, unless it's a very sweet pipe tobacco. If we're going, because, you know, I smoke cigars and I smoke a pipe, so cigars are going to smell significantly less sweet than, like, an aromatic pipe tobacco. If it's a real sweet pipe tobacco, maybe I can see the argument there. Almost perfumey. Um, but... Just the the deepness of notes that they're putting here, the charred wood, the dark chocolate, that's not coming through for me. Maybe some chocolate, maybe some new wood, maybe like a nice light pipe tobacco, but overall this whole nose is a lot brighter to me and they're going more the dark route in my opinion. But let's move on to the palate because this is where I think we're going to agree quite a bit. Uh, Full-bodied spice front followed by vanilla, honey, and dried apricot. I would argue with this with this palette, you could put the spice or the sourness of the fruit as the thing that's in the front. For sure, it's something that I would consider to be punchy. It's something that's got punch to it, and it blocks that vanilla and that honey and that dried apricot. It blocks those a little bit, and then when it falls away, that's when those sweet notes come through. So for sure, vanilla, honey, and apricot, they hit the nail right on the head with those. Where they're saying full-bodied spice, I almost, to me, it reminds me more of a sourness of a fruit, and I see some spice throughout, but I'm not seeing, like, specific spices. That's, you know, that's one of those things. It's a matter of personal opinion. Maybe I try this later, and I agree more with them, and I I hate disagreeing with the distiller's notes too much because I don't want to make it seem like they're just a fraud or I don't I wouldn't want anybody to think that or I wouldn't want anybody to think that I'm purposefully trying to be edgy and trying to put down the distiller's notes I'm just telling you the what I'm getting from it um, but I I definitely think their palate they they basically hit the nail on the head if you think it's spice more than it's sour they basically hit the nail on the head so I'm actually going to try it again and think about it as being spice rather than sour and kind of see where I land here I could see an argument for it. I could see, you might, I think I mentioned earlier black pepper. I could see that kind of a thing. But I still think, for me, it's a fruitiness. And maybe it's because it's paired with that apricot that I'm getting almost like a sour fruit. But nevertheless, pretty solid uh, palate notes there. And then on the finish, they say lingering honey sweetness on toasted oak. I agree. I think their notes here are solid. I just, for me, see the toasted oak. I see that more as graininess, and that, that's almost definitely because I drink so much bourbon, which is mostly corn, that the maltiness is coming through to me as malty graininess, not coming through to me as oak. Uh, but I agree with, I think I mentioned like a new wood, like a little bit of a woodiness, so that honey to me, it takes a back seat. You get more of that maltiness, maybe a little bit of wood with it, uh, and that kind of takes over the finish. Doesn't last overly long. I forgot to mention this earlier. Not the longest finish in the world, especially at this price range, but with the amount of complexity that we're really digging into this this whiskey, we're really tearing it apart and seeing how complex it is. I think that's okay. <laughs> the finish doesn't last the longest in the world because the palate, there's a a for sure transition. There's a for sure, if I agree with anything on their notes, it's that the palate is broken into a front and a back. You're you're getting something for sure right up front, and it's definitely melting away into something different. So I don't want to say that I, I wholeheartedly disagree with their notes. They definitely, at their core, we're talking about the same stuff. We're talking about a nose. They're, they're saying the nose is way darker, but we're talking about a nose that is nice and sweet, uh, I would throw in a little bit of a sourness to it, a body that has something punchy followed by nice, sweet, relaxing notes, and then a finish that's definitely honey and something else that to me comes across as grainy, to them comes across as toasted oak. You can totally see how those two would be kind of similar in my personal opinion. Um, so I'm not, I'm overall, as, as much as I disagree with their notes on paper, the let's say vibe of their notes i think i pretty much agree with i've had worse tasting notes to be honest but i think they really tried to dress up that nose a little bit 
in my opinion. I'm not accusing. I'm not saying they're wrong for it. Could just be I have a different palate than the person who did this. I have a different nose than the person who did this. To me, the nose seems so radically different from the palate and the finish in the notes that they give. And it's not that radical of a change. There's definitely a change, but to me, it's not that radical. That's just my personal opinion. But what I will say, and I don't want to come across as being negative here, because what I will say is this is super enjoyable for me. I really liked this this glass. I loved that the nose and the palate and the finish are different. Maybe not as different as they said it was, but definitely different. Uh, and the palate itself has some transition to it, has some different things going on. Uh, it brought to me a lot of the bakery sweet type flavors that you guys, if you've been listening for a while, you know that I love. Uh, Buffalo Trace tends to bring that rather than honey. It's more like caramel, but you get the idea. Very bakery centric. Uh, as far as Irish whiskey goes, I really am enjoying this. I would love to try this next to Redbreast um, and maybe Green Spot. I want to start doing some more with some Irish whiskey, so I might be doing that. I might be trying some of these side by side, but definitely not unimpressed. I'm definitely happy with the amount that this costs. I believe it's about $70, if I'm not mistaken, in my area. That seems pretty fair to me. That's pretty close to what Redbreast is as well. Uh, and it gives me way more boldness and way less bitterness than I get from some other Irish whiskeys, from most other Irish whiskeys. Maybe that's why they do those dark notes. Maybe if I drank a lot of Irish whiskey, I'd be like, this is way more bold and darker. Um, and so that's why I don't like to ever say, well, they're they're lying on their tasting notes. It could very well just be a difference of palate, which is usually the case. But for me, not overly dark on the nose. Definitely more darkness, more boldness than most Irish whiskeys that I would say. More depth, more body to it than most Irish whiskeys that I've had. So I'm excited to do some blinds with this, which I probably will be doing. Uh, but that's my full, uninfluenced, trying to be unbiased opinion on the nose, the palate, and the finish of this. Hopefully this episode was super helpful for you guys, kind of walking through what I was tasting and how I was doing the tasting. Like I said, I might start incorporating these a little bit more often. But I let me know what you think about the powers, because I personally am more impressed than I expected to be from this especially you bourbon drinkers out there that listen to me a lot of you guys probably drink bourbon because i do a lot of bourbon on the podcast i'm curious how this compared to the green spot if you did that for me this is closer to a bourbon closer to the body the spiciness the bakeriness of a bourbon than the green spot was curious if anybody else is feeling that way but that's all that I can say about this whiskey. I could go on for days trying to pick it apart, and sometimes I do and get a little carried away with my notes, but that's all that I can say for these notes. Last thing before we wrap up, I do want to shout out our top-tier patron. We have one new top-tier patron on the Patreon this month, and that is Luke Carter. So, Luke, thank you for signing up to be a top-tier patron. If you sign up for that top tier, the seasoned noobs tier, you will get a shout-out on the show when you sign up. So, thank you, Luke, for signing up. I really appreciate everybody who signed up for the Patreon. I know that some of you have signed up for those lower tiers as well. I'm super grateful to all of you guys. That is I can't even express to you how much of a help that is for the show to have a little bit of income coming from that, help pay for some of this whiskey, this equipment that I use, all those things. Thank you so much to all you guys. Thank you, Luke, for signing up as a top-tier patron, and I'm looking forward to announcing more of you guys as you sign up, if you sign up, if you like what I'm doing. But that's all I've got for today, guys. So I will leave you with learn to drink, drink to learn. Thank you for listening to this episode of Whiskey Noobs. If you like the show, please make sure to leave a five-star rating or review to help grow the show and get the word out. You can also find more Whiskey Noobs content on Instagram at Whiskey underscore Noobs and on TikTok at Whiskey Noobs Podcast. If you want to drink right along with me, make sure to join the email list by sending an email to WhiskeyNoobsPodcast at gmail.com with a subject line saying email list. You will receive monthly emails with a list of the whiskeys that will be featured throughout the month so that you can buy them ahead of time and drink right along with the show. Once again, thanks for listening to this episode. The Whiskey Noobs podcast does not support underage or otherwise irresponsible consumption of alcohol.